So the next concept that we want to understand before you even get into deriving the problem is something called the uh, lump capacitance time constant. Okay, so we'll just write this up here. So lump capacitance time constant. And this is often called tau LC, tau lump capacitance. Um, the idea with the lump capacitance time constant is it's an indicator of how long this object, whatever you're modeling, is going to take to respond to the surroundings. So let's maybe as a thought experiment imagine, I go through and I calculate the amount of time this body is going to take to respond. And let's say I find that it takes a really, really short amount of time to respond. So like, you know, three hundredths of a second is the characteristic response of this, of this uh, object. If I then plotted, you know, we go through the derivation, but then I plotted the result, you're going to see that this body basically follows exactly along the ambient temperature line because it's just responding really, really quickly. Uh, so if, I, if that was the case, I might say, well, why bother going through the whole derivation? If, if, you, if, I, if you want to know what the temperature is at any moment of time, just tell me the ambient temperature because that's what it's going to be, right? So that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is let's say I know my response in the ambient or my, uh, my forcing function, the ambient condition is f less than half a second. But my body takes uh, 30 seconds to respond. So by the time this whole thing you know, comes and goes, my, my uh, object has had almost no response at all. So again, in that scenario, I might say I'm not going to bother with a model because stuff is happening in the surroundings, but it's not affecting my my object. So, you know, again, the whole approach is like, let's minimize the amount of work we have to do. Let's, let's be lazy about this as much as possible. So if you find in either of these two cases that it's really fast or really slow relative to the actual response, the, the forcing function that you're putting in, don't bother, right? Don't waste your time. It's only in these cases where this time constant sort of on the same order of magnitude as uh, the forcing function that you actually care. So here, if our tau was you know, 0.3 sec 0.229 seconds, that's about the same order of magnitude as my ambient temperature condition. So in that situation, we do want to understand what's going on. OK, so to calculate this lump capacitance time constant, um, it's kind of a surprisingly simple thing. It's tau LC is equal to the resistance to the surroundings. Right? So that's the resistance from the surface of the body to the surroundings. That could include convection, radiation, whatever. Uh, times the heat capacitance of the object, C. Uh, we'll call this a capital C. Right? Uh, where capital C is equal to the mass of the object times the specific heat capacity, lowercase c. So all this is saying is, um, well, let's, let's look at the units here real quick and you'll kind of see. So resistance is going to be Kelvin per watt, mass is uh, kilogram, specific heat is joules per kilogram Kelvin, right? So Kelvin cancels out, kilogram cancels out, uh, joule and a watt becomes uh, joule per second, right? joule per second. So then joules cancel out, and you're left with the units of seconds. So tau LC has units of seconds which, again, is an indication that this is a really good way of telling us something about the response of the system, the time response of the system. Um, so first thing you do is calculate VO number. Convince yourself you can use lump capacitance. If not, we have to do something else. Uh, second thing is look at the time constant. Convince yourself you need to actually do anything at all. Uh, and those are always the two things you're going to want to do when you're first solving this type of problem. OK. Questions on this? OK. So with that, let's go through the derivation of how we would come up with an analytical model for temperature as a function of time. So we start with our sphere. And the first thing we're going to do is draw a control volume. The question is, first, what is my control volume? Um, so let me, let me just down here draw another sphere. And where, where is my control volume? 
Is it going to be, let's say, you know, it's a sphere, so probably would it be like a radial slice, or is it something else? Right? Think about that for a second. So while you're thinking about that, realize what we're trying to do is model the entire thing as a single temperature. So I don't want any differential, or di differential control volume in any dimension inside this body. Right? I want the entire control volume to go around the entire object like this. This is really hard to see. It's red and white. Right, I've got my control volume going around the entire object like this. And that, that again should make sense. We, we aren't trying to model any temperature gradients inside there. So now I'm going to look at what's, what's occurring. So I have, uh, well I know I'm going to have heat loss from this thing or heat addition. I'm going to draw it going out. So we'll say this is Q dot uh, convection. Right, we're only told about convection up here. Um, what else do I have? I have some change of the energy state of this object with time. So before all of this, we would always neglect any internal energy change. We said it's at steady state. Now this, this thing is changing energy with time. So I need to include a new, a new term called D capital U, DT, right? where U is the internal energy uh, of this object, joules, um, joules associated with uh, energy in the object. Uh, what else? I don't have any generation here. Um, I don't have anything going in. So this is it, right? This is my energy balance, or my, my control volume for this. All right, so with this, now we can do our uh, energy balance. So we would write in plus generated equals out plus stored. I don't have anything coming in. I don't have anything generated. So I only have things out, and I only have things stored. So that would be uh, written as 0 is equal to Q dot convection plus D capital U dt. Next step is find expressions for these, right? Find um, equations that define those, those individual terms. So first, uh, I guess the easy one is the convection. So let's say if Q dot convection is going to be, uh, we're given H bar, the surface area of the sphere, uh, and then the temperature of this body, which is a function of time, minus the ambient temperature, T infinity, which is also a function of time. Right? We had that, that curve that we're trying to follow. So that's my convective heat transfer. Uh, DUDT. So DUDT is going to be, uh, let's see, write this out. Let's write this out over here. So D capital U DT is equal to D, the product of mass times uh, specific internal energy, lowercase u DT. Um, turns out mass is not changing as a function of time, so that's a constant. You can pull that out, and we're left with that equaling uh, m, sorry, let me get this. That equals m d lowercase u dt. d capital U dt equals m d lowercase u d temperature, right, times d temperature d time, right. This up here is c. Sorry about that. M D U D T is C. You guys have taken thermal recently, probably caught that, but all right, that's specific heat capacity. Okay, so we have these two things. We can now bring them back together, and we have our our uh, differential equation that we need to solve. So writing this out, um, what I'm going to do is skip a algebra step, and we'll just write it this way. So D T D T plus H bar times A S uh, divide di divide through that by that M times C uh, times temperature is equal to H bar times A S over M C times T infinity, which is a function of time. All right. So just doing some algebra there, just to write this out in in standard form. So we have our differential with respect to time temperature. We have a, te a term involving temperature. Again, temperature is a function of time. 
And then we have this thing on the right-hand side, which is not, a, not dependent on temperature in any way, but it is dependent on the independent variable time. So you should recognize this, right? Now this is a non-homogeneous ODE. And we're going to need to solve this the same way we've solved other non-homogeneous ODEs, which is to break it into a particular solution and a homogeneous solution. Okay, so let's do that. We'll make that substitution where we say T is equal to TH plus TP. Again, remembering everything there is a function of time. Um, we substitute that in, and uh, we, are en we end up with this equation. It's a little bit messy. So DTH DT plus TH um, let me pause here. This term out in front, this guy here, <coughs> we should recognize that uh, if we look back. So if we look back, uh, where was that? If we look back here, um, it turns out that that expression, if we evaluate our surroundings times m times c, that's that term out in front. Or one over that term. So this ends up being uh, one over tau LC, right? Just we have our convective resistance, right? Uh, 